Lewis's trilemma, also known as lie, lunatic, or lord, is an old 18th century argument for the divinity of Christ, elaborated on and popularised by well-known fiction author and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis, whom it was later named after. As one can likely expect from Christian theology, the argument is... deeply flawed. Yet, more important to us and this video, it's also entirely dependent on ableism. So let's talk about that. Though before we get around to doing so, I just need to give a content warning for the following. Ableism, mental health, and PTSD. If you like our work and appreciate the research put into each video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing our work on social media like Twitter and Discord. Funnily enough, I can actually remember the first time I came into contact with this argument. Something I can't say for a lot of the arguments I've dealt with over the years. I first heard Lewis's Trilemma during a talk I attended by Peter S. Williams at the University of Surrey, named Calling the New Atheist Bluff. Just a little history note, at the start of the 2010s, the term New Atheist was almost entirely used by apologists to browbeat any atheist who questioned whether the UK or the US should be a Christian theocracy. With the advent of Gamergate, this is not the case anymore. Now, I attended the talk at the request of my university's Christian Union, who were organising the event. To say I was not impressed by the lecture or Williams in general would be a vast understatement. The Q&A was a massacre. So much that Williams, who had up until then posted the Q&As as part of the same audio file as the lecture, cut the Q&A off. This is in spite of the fact that he'd promised me personally that he'd upload it when I asked him at the end of the lecture. My time at university was... interesting, to say the least. But the fact remains, this argument is not dead. There are those who still view Lewis's trilemma to be a viable argument in support of Christianity. So I think there's value in exploring it and discussing the ways in which it reflects people's attitudes towards the neurodivergent and those of us with mental health problems. So, without further ado, I give you Lewis's trilemma as presented by himself. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was, and is, the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was, and is, God. In fact, Lewis was so fond of this argument that he snuck it into his children's work, The Chronicles of Narnia, part of his efforts to indoctrinate young and impressionable minds into a more susceptible state. We see him apply the same mislogic in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, specifically the scene in which Peter and Susan seek out the professor, worried about Lucy's claims to have been to Narnia. Logic said the professor, half to himself. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it is obvious she is not mad. For the moment, then, and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume she is telling the truth. Now the first thing I want to make clear is the fact that, contrary to the scenario presented in Lewis's Trilemma, 
I don't see the figure of Jesus, mythical or historical, to be a great teacher, moral or otherwise, not even remotely. In fact, I view many of the teachings found in the New Testament to be fundamentally harmful, some of them having done so much damage over the millennia as to deeply scar Western culture. But that's another topic for a different day. For the sake of this video, let's assume that the teachings found in the New Testament are exceptional. Well, there's also the issue of the fact that Jesus has never been verified as a historical figure, let alone the sermons found in the Bible which were written long after his supposed death. He also never actually claimed to be God in those stories, that was the anonymous authors. But again, for the sake of argument, let's assume there was a historical figure and he claimed to be God. That just leaves us Lewis's three options. Liar, lunatic, or lord. Although, people have offered additional options throughout the decades, such as the possibility that he was merely a prophet, that he made good faith mistakes, that he was a hypocrite, and so on. In summary, there's really no end to the issues inherent with this argument. It is deeply flawed from a philosophical standpoint. But I want to focus specifically on the assertion that Jesus, if he did exist and had claimed to be God, could not have been mentally ill. Why? Well, as Lewis framed it, Jesus would have had to have been deluded, quote, on the level of the man who says he is a poached egg, end quote. Except that's not true. We have to remember that, at the time, prophets, demigods, and avatars were a dime a dozen. Shitty political takes of the creators aside, one of the things the Monty Python crew got right with their movie The Life of Brian was the fact that there were prophets starting up cults everywhere during said period. Early Christians not only clashed with, but were thought to have stolen elements of their own scripture from some of these groups, such as the cult of Mithras. In fact, the only reason Christianity survives today and Mithraism doesn't is because Christianity set out to destroy Mithraism during the Christianization of Rome, in part due to its similarities to Christianity. As Luther H. Martin, professor of religion at the University of Vermont, put it, The cult was vigorously opposed by Christian polemists, especially by Justin and Tertullian, because of perceived similarities between it and early Christianity and with the anti-pagan decrees of the Christian Emperor Theodosius during the final decade of the 4th century, Mithraism disappeared from the history of religions as a viable religious practice. Why am I bringing all this up? Well, one criteria of a mental illness is that it has to violate social norms. That's not the sole criteria, a mental illness must also cause harm, such as by interfering with day-to-day -day functioning, but it is one of them. Point is, the social norms of a culture play a big part in what is deemed a mental illness. We could look at a person whose behaviour suddenly changes, with them refusing to drink water when thirsty during the warmest parts of the day, claiming to seek the favour of some invisible entity, and wonder if there was an underlying mental health problem there. But the moment I acknowledge the person is Muslim, that they do so as part of Ramadan, and that they've been raised to partake in it culturally as a means of showing their religious devotion, that changes everything. Likewise, whilst the idea of a person genuinely believing themselves to be divine today seems like something only a person with a bizarre delusion would believe, that wasn't the case back then. Jesus supposedly grew up in a society in which claims to be connected to the divine are commonplace. All that's really needed then are a random series of events that appear favourable, and human apophenia, i.e. the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things, and it becomes very easy to see how such a person could come to the conclusion that they must be divine. It really isn't as outlandish as C.S. Lewis pretends. However, there's a deeper implication being made here, and that's the idea that people with atypical thinking cannot create or say something of value. The reality is, even people with bizarre delusions today, delusions which 
literally cannot be true are usually otherwise indiscernible from people without bizarre delusions. They socialize and function typically, and yes, they could impart great moral teachings upon the rest of the world. In fact, I'm going to go one step further and say that such people are more likely to do so. Why? Well, people with atypical thinking, so those of us with mental health problems and the neurodivergent, are more likely to see what others have missed or have been conditioned to miss, meaning they're more likely to challenge the status quo. I mean, our fucking survival has been made to depend on it, and there is evidence to back this up. For example, autistic people are less willing, on average, to hurt a stranger for their own financial gain. Now, that might not sound like very much, but considering we live in a capitalist society, capitalism literally being an economic system grounded in the exploitation of other people's labour, it does run counter the social norm. Autistic people are less likely to take things as a given, they're more likely to question consensus and form their own conclusions, and that makes them less likely to conform and to partake in systemic violence. The sad fact is, because the researchers behind said paper share the same ableist assumptions as Lewis, believing that the neurodivergent could offer nothing of value or surpass their neurotypical peers, they chose to frame said behaviour as a quote, deficiency, end quote. This is in spite of the fact that it would have been celebrated had this been shown about any other group. I remember atheists, Christians and Muslims fighting over studies like these in an attempt to show the group they belonged to was more morally outstanding. But the moment said behaviour was shown to be more frequent among autistic people, suddenly the same thing becomes a negative. It's shit like this that hurts, both as an autistic person and as someone who suffers from PTSD. This idea that, as someone who is not neurotypical, my efforts can never amount to anything of value. And that's a narrative we are all taught our entire lives, meaning that when we're diagnosed or realise we fall into one of these groups, it can be absolutely soul-crushing. So I think it's time to put this argument to rest, not simply because it's absolute trash, but because it's predicated on an extremely harmful myth about the neurodivergent and those of us with mental health problems. Though we need to do more than that, we also need to challenge the very same ableism in today's rhetoric, regardless of which circle it's present in. We also need to question why people are so adverse to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, neurotypical people aren't superior to the rest of us. Because whilst I use Lewis's trilemma as a talking point, this style of ableism is not limited to Christian apologetics or even religion. Many atheists share the same ableist perspectives. In fact, they tend to be drawn to ableism as their casual insult for religious people. And hands up here, I used to be like that too. I used to have a particular affinity for a certain M-word before I began phasing it out around 2014. So we can do better than that, and we should do better than that. Not simply because it's unfair towards religious people to simply dismiss their beliefs as clinical delusions, but because it hurts the neurodivergent and those of us with mental health problems, further stigmatising us. So yeah, just a short video on my moral issue with Lewis's trilemma, and how it reflects our societal ableism. If you have any questions or criticisms, do post them below, just know that abuse won't make it through. If you like what we do here, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make all this possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Hannah Banghart, Garrett Van Voorst, Soroy and Katie, Kafuluru, and Sosh Daniels. And for myself, Odita and Levi, take care now.